The books in our New Testament, at least, are the books that early Christians copied and shared with each other from one place to the, to the other the most. And so it, it was sort of a natural process. Nobody ever got together in a smoke-filled room and voted on which books would be okay to be in the Bible. Emperor Constantine didn't settle uh, the question of what books should be included or which gospels should be included. I know Dan Brown says that in the Da Vinci Code, but he's quite mistaken on that. It was the churches at large uh, under local leadership that settled these matters in response to the recognition of, hey, these are apostolic writings, of course they're authoritative. But another part of the question might have to do with, well, why is it closed? Why have a closed canon at all? Their basic criterion was, um, does this document testify to the core values of the faith? Is it suitable for reading in church? If they approved it for reading in church, that meant they thought it was consistent with the basic core of, of church teaching. Why were other manuscripts found later, such as the Gospel of Thomas, not included? The canon, the list that we now have, was a list that was chosen sometime around the 350s, sometime between 325 and 375, and some was put out, some was kept in. The importance, actually, of all the material that's out is that you don't really understand what's in unless you know that was a choice. If you thought, for example, there was only four versions of the Gospel and we got them all in there, then you see there's all these other ones. Wow, so now I can understand these ones because they wanted this type in and the other type out. So it is an act of exclusion, as all canons are. I can see why the early church uh, rejected the Gnostic Gospels produced in the second and third centuries, because the Gnostic Gospels uh, denied the, uh, the reality of the Incarnation. They denied the humanity of Jesus. When we think about the Gospels, we have copies or fragments of dozens of Gospels outside our New Testament Gospels. Very few historians would consider many of them at all as serious sources for reconstructing who Jesus was and what he said. They can be very informative for informing us about second, third, or fourth century Christianity. But there are very few cases, the most famous case being the Gospel of Thomas, where some very serious scholars have thought, hey, we might have some authentic, ancient traditions that go back to Jesus in this document. And those are issues that, that scholars debate. By and large, no one would confuse the non-canonical Gospels with the canonical Gospels in terms of their historical reliability. Critics have pointed to the errors that crept into the manuscripts during the copying process throughout the early centuries, suggesting these mistakes have compromised the reliability of the Bible. There was absolutely copying errors, and we know them, we can see them. Does it compromise it? I would say flatly no. I get a very clear message from the Bible, and I think it would take massive, massive rewriting to change that basic message. So yes, it's true. As, as we've heard in the media, there are thousands of copyists and scribal mistakes in these thousands of manuscripts but there are also thousands of corrections. We have a pretty good idea how the originals uh, read when Paul wrote his letter to the Romans or Matthew wrote his uh, gospel we call the Gospel of Matthew. Another critique involves apparent or real contradictions that are found in the Bible. The gospels in the New Testament sometimes have slightly different versions of the same story. Critics often cite examples like Mark 16 verses one and two, Compare this with John's account in chapter 20, verse one. I know a lot of people are shaken sometimes by what they think, are, they say are these apparent contradictions. You know, uh, why can't they get it right? Why can't two gospels ever agree on anything? Why, why, how many angels are at the tomb? How many women ran to the tomb? What's it say over Jesus' cross? I mean, over and over and over again, we get these, these uh, kind of uh, different descriptions of the same facts. It seems to me that the first authors could have seen these kinds of problems and could have said, you know, about a thousand years from now, someone's not gonna like this. Let's make this legit and make these changes now. Let's toss that piece out, because that makes us look like we're stupid. You could have done all that work early on. Uh, there's no reason to be pessimistic and, and to wonder, well, we have no idea what the original authors read. We're about 99% certain 
we just have so many manuscripts where we can compare, we are able to determine almost 100% of what the original text was. Besides the biblical manuscripts, scholars point to the wealth of archaeological evidence that supports the Bible. If the Bible was nothing but a book of myths, talking about people who never lived and events that never occurred, places that never existed, there'd be no such thing as biblical archaeology because there'd be nothing found that correlated with the Bible stories. And so there's this correlation and this mutual illumination, the Bible shedding light on the archaeologist's work, the archaeologist's work shedding light on the Bible, and it's that mutual clarification and illumination that gives me a lot of confidence that these stories, these narratives in the Bible are not just a bunch of fairy tales, but are uh, talking about real people, real places, and real events. If evidence supports the Bible's reliability, what about those who declare it to be God's literal words? Would this mean that the Bible is infallible? In one of the letters in the New Testament, there is the assertion that all Scripture is God-breathed. And that's literally what it means is breathed out or expired of God. And then it goes on to say that the Scriptures can instruct and can correct, equip, and prepare. Some people jump on and say, oh, this is proof of inerrancy or this is proof that every single problem or discrepancy can be resolved. That isn't what the author was talking about. The author is saying because the scriptures have this God-breathed character, you can be properly instructed. You should turn to them for your theology, for your understanding of God's revelation. We never want to lose sight of what the message of the Bible is. The message of the Bible isn't the Bible. The message of the Bible is what God has done for us, and especially what He's done in His Son, Jesus Christ. And we need to stay focused on that. Given the controversy surrounding terms like inerrant or infallible, in 1978, some 300 biblical scholars and Christian leaders gathered to establish the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy in order to clarify and adopt a common understanding of its meaning. Their final statement included these words. Scripture is without error or fault in all of its teaching, no less in what it states about God's acts in creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God. Holy Scripture, being God's own word, written by men prepared and superintended by His Spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises.